complex DMEX surgery is one of my absolutely favorite things to do. But that's not what this video is about. This video is about the normal, everyday complicated cases that we see, which is to say, surgeries that are a little bit different than just the normal Fuchs dystrophy eyes, and yet are still very routine, and you should expect to encounter them frequently. So this is a patient that we operated on in our, in our office just five days ago, and I wanna show you the full unedited video and walk you through the various elements of this surgery to try to help understand what's going on and why we do the things that we do for this particular case. So this is a patient with bolus keratopathy who was referred to us for a DMEC, and you'll notice some of the features of this eye. First is that it's inflamed. The eye is injected, particularly there is this circumlimbal injection around the eye. And you'll notice over here by me, temporarily, there's a tube shunt. So for sure the diagnosis is bullous keratopathy, and you would think perhaps that that's related to the tube, but actually probably in this case it's not. Because this eye likely has a history of HSV keratitis, and that is the probable culprit for the endothelial failure. And one reason that I say that, even though I am often the first to point the finger at the tube shunt for causing endothelial dysfunction, is you'll notice how inflamed this eye is. We see that all the time in eyes that have a history of HSV, even if they don't look inflamed in the clinic, when you get them into the operating room and you lay the patient flat and you swing the microscope into position, these eyes just look injected. And this should be an indicator, if you haven't already suspected it, that this may be a viral endotheliolitis. And it's not just that these eyes are injected on the operating room table, but they also bleed during the surgery. You get bleeding from the subtenon's block and you get bleeding from the angle when you're coming in and out of the eye. So for sure, if you're seeing an eye in which you're getting some unexpected bleeding from the surface of the eye or from the in innards of the eye, particularly an eye that looks injected, you should be suspicious if you're not already that there's an endotheliolitis. So we'll roll the tape and I'll walk you through the surgery. So the first thing that we do is we make a pyridomy and into that pyridomy we inject one cc of sub tenons expiril and you'll notice we're using a 19 gauge angiocath which is flexible and that makes it more comfortable to do the injection. I'll make a few paracentesis and one thing I do with my side port incisions is I always turn the bevel such that the bevel is facing up. So if the patient bells reflex rolls their eye up, they don't lacerate the cornea. That's a trick that I learned from Dick McCool. It's a safer way to make the incision. Now, normally I make the main wound temporarily over here by me, but we have to trim this patient's tube shunt. And so I'll make the main incision away from me. I'm making it at 12 o'clock because the main incision should be 90 degrees away from the tube to facilitate trimming the tube. And I'll show you that later on in the case. Now I'm gonna put a 23 gauge anterior chamber maintainer into one of these distal paracentesis, and I'm gonna use an inverted Sinsky hook to score Decimase membrane 360 degrees around. And you'll notice how seemingly unstable the anterior chamber is, the fluctuation in the depth of the anterior chamber. And the reason for that is because these eyes that have a history of a tube shunt, especially a tube placed for something like HSV, tend to have anterior synechia. And those anterior synechia pull the iris diaphragm up. They're scarring between the iris and the back of the cornea, basically out into the periphery. And that makes the chamber unstable and predisposed towards collapse. That's why it's so useful to do the decimeterexis with the facility of an AC maintainer pumping air into the anterior chamber. Now, the way that I started with the air pump technique which I think was developed by this brilliant Indian ophthalmologist, Susan Jacob, and taught to me by an equally brilliant Israeli ophthalmologist, Eitan Livni, is by using the air pump connected to a vitrectomy machine. That's super easy. You just plug the AC maintainer into your vitrectomy machine and that will pump air into the eye. 
The problem is, is that a vitrectomy machine setup is expensive in the office. Not everybody has one to use in the office. And so the sort of cheap version of that, the low tech alternative, is to use an AC maintainer connected to a 60cc syringe, which my assistant holds and just depresses the plunger on the syringe. And 60cc is nice because it gives you a lot of volume to play with. And once you each reach the end of your rope and you've depressed the syringe all the way, that's fine. You just stop and the assistant reloads. But typically it takes one or two reloads to complete the entire decimeterexis. But it's a very efficient way to strip under air without having to come in and come out and constantly re reload the eye with a cannula. So that's the way that we maintain the volume of the anterior chamber. And the reason we like stripping under air preferentially is because your visibility is so much better. If you use air as opposed to viscoelastic, you can see what you're doing much better during the operation. And it's quicker because you don't have to then evacuate the viscoelastic from the eye. I was talking also to this brilliant Canadian ophthalmologist recently named Steve Arshinoff, you know, responsible for the Arshinoff shell and a bunch of other interesting techniques, who happens to be a viscoelastic expert. And what he explained to me is that really it's basically impossible to remove all the viscoelastic from the eye once you put it in, even if you're using a cohesive. And as a result, if you use viscoelastic during your stripping, you're going to leave some behind and that can interfere with attachment of the DMET graft. So that's another reason not to use viscoelastic because you have to worry about it precipitating a detachment. Now, I'm using these serrated coaxial forceps now just to strip these little lingering bits of decimase membrane out from the eye that were left behind from the inverted Sinsky hook. That is such a useful technique as opposed to pawing at it feebly with the inverted Sinsky forever. The other reason I like using serrated forceps is because you need them to trim the tube shunt. And now I'm gonna show you how to do that. You reach directly across from the tube using these serrated coaxial forceps. You grab the tube and put it on stretch. You pull it towards you. And then from 90 degrees away, you use these intraocular scissors. In our case, these are 23 gauge Packer Chang IOL cutting scissors. And you pull the tube and you stretch it and you cut the length with those forceps and then you pull out the residuum. And that's the way we like to trim the tube because it's so quick and easy to do it that way and you don't stretch out the wounds. That's much, much better than trying to do a conge cut down or something like that. It's just a very efficient, quick way to cut the tube. And I like cutting the tube because then it gives you more room for DMAT graft unfolding where you're not knocking the graft against the tube. The next thing we do is we replenish the preservative-free lidocaine. That's what I was just injecting into the anterior chamber. And that facilitates the next couple of steps of the operation, which is to say the iridotomy, which I'll make here using a little capsulotomy handpiece, which comes with our Ertley phaco emulsifier. It cauterizes a hole in the far peripheral iris, which is nice because you can make a very distal PI in a bloodless fashion. You don't have to cut down and pull the iris out of the eye and snip with scissors. You can cauterize a little hole and put it way out peripherally, even over the ciliary body, which allows you to leave a big air bubble in the eye without fear of bleeding. Now in this eye, which I think is gonna be tending towards collapse in a shallow chamber, I'm doing something I don't normally do at this stage, which is hydrate the wounds. Because when you're doing DMEC to unfold the graft, you need a chamber of sufficient depth to open up the edges of the tissue. And if the chamber is collapsed and it's too shallow, you'll never get the thing open. So you have to make sure the chamber is, is capable of being deepened so you want to make sure that it's not leaking from the wounds. And here I am injecting the graft and you'll see it's this kind of wadded, scrumbled mess. And I just deepen the chamber to get it to perk up and open a bit. And I'm evaluating the orientation. Here it looks like the graft is upside down to me just by my assessment of the edges of the tissue. So to flip the tissue, typically what you do is you inject saline through a wound while burping that wound. And that creates an eddy current that flips the graft over, which you'll see there. 
And now the graph looks vaguely right side up to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to check the orientation here. That's right side up. So with a few little shuffling bumps over, we'll push the graft over into the appropriate position of the eye and apply some Dierzomer taps to open the graft to the rest of the way. Now, graft sizing here is a little bit of a compromise. With bullous keratopathy, you want a big graft with lots of cells. But in a complex eye, if you're worried, what size graft should I use? You use a small graft or a smaller one than you would normally be inclined to use if you have a shallow chamber. Because with a deep, with, with, with a big graft, if you're trying to tumble it over and maneuver it and the chamber is cramped, it'll be more difficult. So a smaller graft is easier to maneuver within the cramped confines of a shallow chamber. This is the end of the operation. You'll notice we leave about a 95%, 98% air bubble, which you can see already interacting with that tube. But that's okay, that's all right. We, we finish the operation here. We sit the patient up right away with no supine posturing in the clinic, and we discharge them home with no supine posturing at home. So the reason I show this video is because we do a case like this every week. We do a uh, DMAC for an eye with HSV keratitis every week because it's such a common pathology. And kind of the key points here that I just want to highlight are, uh, number one, these are eyes that bleed. You'll see bleeding during the subtenon's block. You'll see bleeding during the decimeterexis. That is a normal occurrence. And if you're doing a DMAC in an eye and you see a lot of bleeding, it, it actually should raise the possibility that this eye has an HSV diagnosis, whether or not you've considered that beforehand or not. Um, in eyes with tube shunts, like many of these eyes have, there is an optimal strategy for trimming that shunt, which in my mind rests heavily on where you make your incisions. And making the main wound, which you apply the intraocular scissors through, 90 degrees away from the tube, makes a big difference. And to grab that tube with serrated forceps, so the forceps don't slip off the silicone end, and put it on stretch, for the trimming, that also helps quite a lot. Um, making the iridotomy in these eyes, which are predisposed to bleeding, if you can do that with an intraocular diathermy device, that makes your life so much easier, not only in terms of how you make the iridotomy, but again, in controlling bleeding. When you inject the graft into the eye, if you're unlucky like we are, and you have a shallow anterior chamber and a big graft, and the graft is upside down, and you're thinking, oh, I have to flip this graft over. How do I do it? What's the maneuver? I want to remind you that the way you do that consistently and repeatedly is you inject fluid perpendicular to the lie of the graft, and when you're injecting, you depress the wound that you're injecting from. And that creates an eddy current that reliably flips the graft over. So that's really important to know how you flip a graft, especially when you don't have very much room to do it. So these are the little tips and tricks that you might consider applying to some of these everyday complicated cases that I'm sure you're going to see in your own practice inevitably. Thanks for watching.